it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Cause the God I serve knows only how to triumph. My God will never fail. No, my God will never fail. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see a victory. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. I'm gonna see a victory. I'm gonna see. Show me what it 
there is a kingdom that's advancing at the speed of light and in his kingdom every dead thing is bound to rise oh god our redeemer he is faithful
fortress, you go before us. I praise you as we get ready to pray for our young people, Lord God. I know their lives are going through battles. And Lord, I'm just believing as as our young people, as they come forward, I'm going to ask the ones I ask, help pray for me, uh, with me today, if you'll come up. And as our kids are coming before, you know, I want us as parents to make sure we're living a life that's showing them that the battle is the Lord's and not ours. And I am grateful, Lord God, that you would just continue to teach our young people the battle is not theirs, but yours. Come on up. You can be seated. And if you just extend your hands out as we pray for our kids. Amen. Come on up, kids. Jesus, Jesus, precious Lord, and on the earth, heavens above, and I have found more, more beautiful. You are my treasure, my great reward. I just want to move your heart. It's all I want to do. I just want to stand it on. Oh, my love on you, no matter how much the cost, I freely give it all to you, to you. Jesus, Jesus, my offering, all my ambitions, my hopes, my dreams. Use my life, Lord, as sacrifice, oh, just to bless you. I just want to move your heart. It's all I want to do. I just want to stand in awe and pour my love on you. It's all I want to do, I just want to stand in awe 
You know, I just, you know, if you keep playing through that. You know, it's not that a simple little chorus? Come on. There's not much to it, is it? All I ever need, all I ever want, it's all about you, Jesus. It's easier to sing than live, isn't it? Come on. And I want you to close your eyes. I want you to open your heart. You know, I, I'm, I'm always very aware in life that when we walk into here, I know we put on our clean clothes, we brush our hair, brush our teeth, you know, do all those things. But not always is it always easy. Not is it always easy. And I just want you to, we're going to sing that little chorus through a couple more times. And as we do, you know, whatever is trying to steal your, your joy today, whatever is trying to distract you from Jesus today, you know, I just want us to sing this little chorus through and, and let's sing it with our heart. You know, what's in our heart will come out of our mouth. And you know what? We're not going to let the enemy come in and steal and kill and destroy we're not going to let the enemy come in and just take from us this morning what he would like to take from us. Amen? And, and it's just amazing as we just release that 
that little song to Jesus. As we release that little song to Jesus, I just think his spirit will move over this place and it will touch wounded hearts and heal them. It'll restore hope to those that are hopeless. Okay? It'll give joy to those who are in despair. It'll give direction to those that seem to be lost. Because there's that little chorus that says, all we ever need, all we ever want, is you, Jesus. You know, I get a lot of things that come through my email things. And, and you know, it's amazing in life. One thing I got the other day uh, through Right Now Ministries, it talks about how churches, it doesn't matter small or big, denomination or independent, all the ministers are saying what they're dealing with and it's deadly is apathy in the pews. Apathy. They don't care. They don't care. And you know what? Unfortunately, when apathy takes place in the pews, because there's probably apathy in the home, and if there's apathy in the home, that means there's probably apathy in our reading our Bible and our praying. And so maybe that's you today. I don't know. Maybe. Maybe Jesus doesn't get you excited like it used to. You remember when you first gave your heart to Jesus? I don't know. I do. I remember I knew at that moment I was a sinner and I needed a Savior. And I remember when I asked Jesus into my heart, I was so excited. I, wanted to, I, I went home and I told my mom. Okay, I said, Mom, I became a Christian. Jesus in my heart. And she looked at me and said, that's nice. Okay, she didn't believe all that. But I didn't let that keep me from still telling people about Jesus. And I still have it to this day. And so, you know, maybe apathy in your heart. You know, as we sing this little song, let's just, let's just give our heart a fresh and anew to Jesus this morning. Amen. Come on, let's sing it, saints. All I really need is Jesus. All I really want. Oh yeah, now I'm starting to hear it. You're singing like you mean it. All I really need is you. Jesus. All I really want is you. The King of Kings and Lord of Lords is listening to you. Forgive us for making this more than just about you. Lord, when we come into your presence, you change us. When, you, when we come into your presence, you heal us. When, you, when we come into your presence, you change our perspective. Lord, forgive us for making it more than just a simplicity of it's all about you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus, for your unconditional love to us and through us. We thank you, Jesus. We want to make our marriages. We want to make our families. We want to make our employments. We want to make everything about our life about you, Jesus. Because all these other things are going to come and go and be gone. But that relationship with Jesus is eternal. In your name I pray, amen. Before you're seated, turn to your neighbor and say, it's about Jesus. Would you do that? It's about Jesus. Thank you. You know, uh, I remember when Meryl and I, when we uh, took classes uh, at Faith Baptist uh, Church in Lafayette, Indiana. And we did it for, with counseling, okay, it was for Nusetic counseling. And Nusetic is just a fancy Greek word for biblical counseling. And I remember that they made a very interesting comment one time. And we get in trouble in life when 
we don't differentiate between the temporary and the eternal. And relationships, honestly, friendships, they really, I know we say we're going to be friends with them forever. In reality, we're not, okay? Our relationship with Jesus is eternal. All the other things very much are temporary in life. And so we really need to make sure we focus in on what is that eternal. And, you know, and you know even marriage, I know some people don't maybe believe this, but marriage is temporary. Now, I know some of the guys are saying, Man, I'm getting a way out, hallelujah. Okay, no, no, don't think that, hallelujah. But really, because the Bible says this, the Bible. Everybody say the Bible. The Bible says in, in heaven, there is neither giving or taking of marriage. And somebody said, so my relationship with my wife, my, my marriage with my wife is actually temporary on this earth. And people say, why would you say it? I know this, that my relationship with my wife is very good, but... What I have in heaven is going to be better. It's not going to be marriage. I know some people say, I don't believe that. Well, you don't have to believe that's what the Bible says. Okay, you know what I'm saying? But God's not going to let me have something better on earth with my wife and then me for eternity thinking, man, wasn't it better when we were on earth? No. So maybe I don't understand, comprehend everything, what's going to be better between our relationship. You understand when I get to heaven? But I know it's going to be. Because we, neither is either giving or taking a marriage in heaven. You remember there was the one guy, the Pharisees or the Sadducees, who didn't even believe in the life hereafter. They said, Jesus, there was, a, there was a woman, and she married a man, and before they had children, he died, so she married his brother. And remember, she married seven brothers. And they asked Jesus, they said, whose wife is she going to be in heaven? And if you remember, Jesus said, you do err. And that's what he said, there's not a giving or taking of marriage in heaven. And so we need to make sure that we focus in on what is the eternal things in our life, okay? And I just want to encourage you to do that. It doesn't mean that we should discard our temporary relationship, but we just need to realize what's eternal, what's priority, and what's not. Amen? Well, you know, I want to thank everybody that came out yesterday for our first annual diaper dash we had here at Christ the King, and we helped the uh, Her Health Women's Ministry down in in Sioux City. We had 30 plus people show up and I, do want, to, I want to tell everybody thank you so much for that. Also in a couple weeks, October 7th, 2nd, I hope you'll be here. We're going to have songwriter, a singer, and actually minister Glenn Ashworth, a friend of Marilyn's and ours, that actually is going to be out here. He's from Nashville, Tennessee. I don't even, I don't, we'll probably have the nursery that day, but for the kids, we'll let them stay up because your kids will love hearing Glenn. He has some wonderful music. He, he's written it all. Actually, uh, I know Abby's mom works in Norfolk in the school district. Glenn's daughter teaches at Norfolk, and her name is Erin King, okay? So you, and, so, and, his, and Glenn's daughter, her family lives in Norfolk. She just had a baby, so he's going to be coming out to visit his granddaughter. And so we said, why don't you stop by and, and sing and minister here at church? So he's going to be here on the 2nd of October, okay? And they, I got something. They, they said next Sunday morning, at St. Peter's Church in Newcastle, they're having a brunch from 8.30 to 1 for a free will offering. So if you don't want to cook next Sunday morning and you're heading that way, stop by St. Peter's and you can get something there. Also, tech, November 11th through the 13th that we're having tech this, uh, that weekend. If you have not signed up, we hope you will. If you need to talk to somebody, talk to Gwen or Daryl. They can help you with that. Also, uh, uh, Via de Crisco, is, the men's is October 20th through the 23rd. And the women's is the 27th through the 30th. Contact Kay McAfee. She can help you with that, okay? Also, you know, this past week, Queen Elizabeth died. And, you know, I've been reading a lot of articles about her. She loved Jesus. Billy Graham talked about how her whole life was governed by Jesus. And you know what I can't imagine? I mean, did you see when they were taking her casket and they had her crown up there uh, and, all, and all the jewels? I bet you when she got to heaven and Jesus met her, met her at the pearly gates, he probably said, you know, Jesus, I thought I had a lot of jewels. I thought, Jesus, I was rich, but you actually take gold and you pave streets with it up here. I bet you she was very shocked to find out that all the things that she had really compared to nothing to the majesty of what King Jesus was. And, you know, I was reading another article about that today, about her, how she was back... 20, 25 years ago, she would always go on the TV or the radio in England and read the Christmas story. And some of her advisors came to her and said, you know, Queen, 
England is very diverse now. We have a lot of different religions, a lot of different backgrounds, and maybe we should tone it down a little bit on the Christmas story and about Jesus. And she turned to them and said, I will never tone it down about Jesus. And so, you know what? She left a heritage not only to the, the, to the empire of Britain, but also to her kids and her grandkids, okay? And you know what? That's what we can live to leave with our kids, a heritage, okay? Also, uh, Lori Harding, she's doing really good. She's starting her third treatment. Just keep her in her prayers this week. She's starting her third treatment on Wednesday for cancer. And don't forget, uh, Harold Collins is over in the Elms Nursing Home. And also, uh, you know, ladies, it's never too late to sign up. You know, it's getting close if you'd like to go to the Design for Life uh, thing with the ladies with this. That's October 13th through the 15th. And I'd also like to tell everybody, thank you for getting your kids and the kids getting their friends the edge. We've had really great turnouts with our edges, okay? And this uh, week, uh, like I said, after school edge will be here like normal. And then this week, I guess they met last week at the community center, but went down to the grain train. But we'll be doing that this week at 7 o'clock. And, you know, we got uh, three different groups from church are going, went elk hunting this weekend, okay, are getting ready to, okay? I, you know, is anybody here like elk meat? Well, we're going to pray success for you guys, hallelujah, because we'd like to have some elk meat. And then we'll also, uh, Doug is at a fishing trip with his son out in Wyoming, so keep those people in your prayers. And also in October, and Lacey, you probably told me, I forgot, when is the couples group going to start? October 10th, okay, for couples. This is not for couples that are having marital problems. If you're having marital problems, it's not for that, okay? This is for couples that happen to be married. That includes everybody. You know, yeah, that are not having troubles, okay? So I hope you'll come. It's going to be at the Kitka's house. Uh, we're going to be uh, studying through uh, Right Now Ministries, a six-part series on the art of marriage, okay? So I hope you'll come, and we'll get a little bit more information for you either here. I'll put it out on Remind. But I hope you'll come. There'll be some babysitting. There'll be all those things going on. And so I hope you'll remember that and be a part of that. Because you know what? We can offer all the different programs we want, but if you don't want to come, it's not going to help, Okay? You might say, I got a lot of things going on in my life. Join the crowd. Is your marriage worth it? I just ask you that. Is your marriage worth maybe tell, saying no to something else so your marriage can grow? If you don't think it is, then you know what? Bless your heart. Then you know what? You get what you get. Okay, hallelujah. Okay? But if you think your marriage can, I'm not even say stay a boost, but just get better. Just get better. Does everybody here, does every man think his marriage is as good as it can get? All the men raise their hand and say, yep, every woman, do you think your marriage get better? And every woman raise their hand, yes, I think we can. Because you know what? We can always get better, amen? And so I hope you'll, you'll, you'll come and be a part of that, amen? Well, let's pray and let's bow our heads. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for this day. Lord, all we ever need, and Lord, all we should ever want is you, Jesus. If we can teach our children that, if we can teach our grandchildren, if we can teach our spouses that, Lord God, if we can live that, Lord how much simpler our lives would be. And I thank and I praise you, Lord Jesus, that you want to be king over each of our marriages, over our families, over your church, Lord Jesus. I thank you, Lord God, for the people who have been, excuse me, so faithful in bringing their tithes, their gifts, and their offerings. I thank you so much for the people, Lord God, who have been faithful in their attendance. I thank you for being with all the guys, Lord God, as they're going hunting. Grant them safety, Lord God. Let them have a prosperous time, Lord God. And once fishing, Lord God, be with them, Lord God, and let them know, Jesus, wherever they're at, Lord Jesus, you are always there with them. And Lord, I thank you and I praise your word will not return void, but will accomplish what you want to accomplish in each of our lives. And everybody said, amen. We're going to dismiss the, the kids in third grade and below. They can go downstairs. Thank you so much. And if you would, please turn your Bibles over to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. And... We're continuing on. We're going to finish up, okay, Matthew chapter 8 today on, our, on the 10 miracles of Matthew 8 and 9. I hope, you know, our, if you remember our whole premise of starting this series was we found out that Jesus is the same what? Yesterday? Come on, talk to me. Jesus is the same. Okay, so if we can find out what Jesus was like yesterday what will jesus be like today the same as he was yesterday and if we can find out what jesus was like yesterday if we can find out what jesus was like today then we're going to know what jesus is like 
tomorrow, okay? It's really simple in life. And so many times we hear people maybe say in life, Jesus doesn't do this anymore. Jesus doesn't do that anymore. And what we're finding out is that if you believe them, you actually believe them more than you believe the Bible. Because the Bible said he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So that's why we're going through Matthew 8 and 9. We're just seeing in two chapters how he did 10 miracles. And if Jesus did 10 miracles in Matthew 8 and 9, if he did miracles then, we know he'll do miracles now, and he'll do miracles in the future, okay? If he did healing then, he does healing now, and he'll do healing in the future, amen? So that's what we're just trying to figure out. And see, I don't want you to believe it because I said it. I want you to believe it because that's what the Bible says. See, we all have to have a choice in life. Are we going to believe the Bible or not, okay? So, you know what, does anybody remember last week what the disciples' reward was for following Jesus? Anybody remember? The storm, yes. So here they were, they decided to follow Jesus. We're going to follow Jesus, and how do most people think? Everything's going to be okay, right? And as soon as they decide to follow Jesus, a storm comes into their life, okay? The storm showed us that what? Following Jesus isn't always smooth sailing. But when the waters of life get rough, and they will, Jesus is always there with us to bring calm and peace into our lives. When the waters of life, you know what, folks? It's always going to get, who here has never been in a storm of life? I hope nobody raised their hand because we've all been in storms of life. But we're just, so following Jesus doesn't guarantee us a life of luxury and all that. We're going to have storms. That's what it's, it's called life. But Jesus is always there with us. So now we're going to go in verse 28. So, the, so they just got through the storm, okay? They just got through the storm, and they're getting ready to land. It says in verse 28, Now when he had come to the other side, to the country of the Gadarenas, there, was, uh, uh, there he met two men, demon-possessed men, coming out of the tombs, exceedingly fierce, so that no one could pass that way. And suddenly they cried out, saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, you Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before our time? Now, a good way off from there, there was a herd of many swine feeding. So the demons begged him, Jesus, saying, If you cast us out, permit us to go away into the herd of swine. And he said unto them, Go. So when they had come out, they went into the herd of swine, and suddenly the whole herd of swine ran violently down the steep, uh, the steep place into the sea and perished in the waters. Then those who kept them fled, and they went away into the city and told everything, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. And behold, the whole city came out to meet Jesus, and when they saw him, they begged him to depart from their region. Huh. See, not all storms of life come from the physical environment. See, they had just come through a physical storm, okay? But there's another environment you and I need to realize. It's the unseen world that's dominated by Satan. So here, here, can you imagine? It? We just are following Jesus, man. He just had a winged or some meetings. He says, now we're going to the other side. We get in the boat. Everything is going good, and now we have a physical storm. We think we're all going to die because we're fishermen. We've been in storms before. So now we get, we're in the middle of the Sea of Galilee. We think we're going to die. We're going to drown. And lo and behold, Jesus doesn't even give a rip about us. He's sleeping in the boat. I got news for you. If Jesus is sleeping in the boat, we're not going to die, okay? So he's sleeping in the boat. He gets up and he tells the winds and the waves to be calm, and they do. And now we're back to hallelujah. We're marvelous at God. Things are going good. And now we get off the boat and we meet two demon-possessed men. Uh, is anybody besides you thinking, is it going to get worse than this? Have you ever followed Jesus? Come on. And you think, man, Jesus, is it ever going to get better? It just seems like it's just one thing after another. Or maybe I'm not talking to anybody here today. Maybe I'm just talking to myself. Is it ever going to get better? See, the devil wants us to doubt the goodness of God. But Jesus is there with us. Amen? And now we're seeing that there is a form in that physical realm, but there's also a storm in the spiritual realm. These two men were demon-possessed. Everybody say demon-possessed. Now, you know what? 
Many times we don't want to talk like this. And you know what? There's a lot of people that are not demon-possessed. They may seem that way, but they're not. But to say that people can't be demon-possessed, you are barking up the wrong tree, okay? I'm not going to say you that, that there's a lot of those people running around, but to think it doesn't exist, then the devil has already hoodwinked you, okay? I'm not saying it's common, but it has, you have to know the possibility of it existing because Satan dominates the unseen world. Look at what it says in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. This is Paul writing, he says, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sin, in which you once walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. What's Paul saying about the devil is the prince of the power of the air? The devil is the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. So we need to realize there's physical storms, but there's also spiritual storms. The good news, Jesus takes care of them both. The good news, he brings peace and calm to both storms. See, we don't have to be afraid of those storms. We just need to realize, speak your word, Jesus, and you'll bring calm into those storms. See, until we learn to realize that the unseen world and how it influences us and our thoughts and our actions, we're going to be like a ship tossed back and forth with every wind of doctrine. One of my favorite ministers, many years ago, his name was Jack Hayford. Jack Hayford had a church in Van Nuys, California. God bless Jack Hayford with, with a, a lot of uh, knowledge, and he was the superintendent of the Four Square Gospel Church for many years. And him and his wife, Anna, had a great marriage. And Jack Hayford tells a story. One day, they were in their kitchen. Now, I know this is not talking about any men here, okay, or, or my, our parents and, and marriages. But in one, they were in the kitchen, and Jack was picking at his wife, and his wife was picking at Jack. And this went on for a while, and then Jack Hayford turned to his wife and said, Stop. He said to his wife, Anna, are you for me? She said, Yes, dear, I'm for you. Okay? And Jack said, You know what, Anna, I'm for you. He says, I perceive there is a third entity here that's trying to divide us. Do you understand that? The unseen world. And for us to think that doesn't exist, we're giving the devil, the God of this world, one up on us. And so we need to realize in life sometimes, we need to step away from it all and say, okay, are you for me and I'm for you? Then let's kick out the third entity that's trying to divide us, okay? Very, very important. See, we cannot be naive, we cannot be unaware or to the realm of the unseen world because it's real, be it good or be it evil. The unseen world is real. Has it ever happened to you that you get through one storm before you know it? You're in another storm. One of the first things that happens to most of us when that happens is we ask a question. What is it? Why me? Why me? What have I done to deserve this storm? I don't know if it was Kenny Rogers or somebody, some country western uh, singer, at one time he says, what have I ever done to deserve even? Do you remember that song? Who sang that? Anybody know? But you know the song. And you know what? There's a lot of Christians that way. What have I ever done to deserve even this? And that's our tendency when we get caught in the storms. Okay? Peter, James, and John were excellent fishermen on the Sea of Galilee all their lives. They had no doubt been caught in the up in storms before. But when those storms tried to engulf their lives, they had to rely on their own natural abilities. These two present storms, the wind and the waves and this de these demon-possessed men, these present storms that had intersected their lives were totally different. Now, how? They didn't have to depend on their own natural abilities. Now they can depend on Jesus' ability and trust in him. There's going to come a day, someday, we all have been there, where we're going to be in a storm where we can't get out. We can't get out. And we have to cry out and say, Jesus, save me. And you know what's amazing? He does. These two possessed men gave all the outright signs of life. What do I mean? These men, they moved, they breathed, they walked, 
and they talked. But you know what happened? They were, you know what happened? They both lived among the dead. How many times has, have we been living and breathing and talking and doing all these things, but we're living among the dead in our lives? See, we need to make sure we surround our team. And I see four young kids over, young boys. Thank you for sitting together. Thank you for helping each other. I mean that with all my heart, okay? You've got to surround yourselves with people that are going to help you stay alive. Because if you and I hang around dead people, what are dead people? Dead people can walk. Dead people can talk. Dead people can breathe. Dead people are walking all these things. But they're not going to put life in you. If you hang around people like that, it's only going to affect your life. You've got to get around people that are alive. See, they were as good as dead, these people, because their bodies, their minds, and their spirits had been dominated by a demon, the Bible says. Look what it says in 1 Thessalonians 5, 23. It's interesting here, because that they were out of their mind, they cut themselves, all these things. See, what we need to realize is the real you, the real you, the real Amanda Benson, seriously, is not the one that's sitting right here. It's her spirit on the inside. That's the real Amanda. This Amanda that we see here, unless Jesus comes back, someday you're going to die, and you're going to be put in the ground. And, and, if, and if this was the real Amanda, then Amanda would be gone. But you know what? When any of us breathe our last breath on this earth, none of us are gone. The real us isn't gone. The real you is your spirit. It's going to live forever. Now, in our culture, in our world, you know, it's amazing. Like, we will spend thousands of dollars on exercise equipment that if you go on uh, Facebook, uh, whatever, you could buy for really cheap. Okay, hallelujah. Exercise. You know, we think it's all about the natural things. And then we spend very little time or money educating our spirit, the real us. In fact, the Bible says the, the uh, bodily exercise profited a little. What it means is it doesn't mean that it's not profitable. It just means in the scope of life, our natural life on this in eternity is like that. And all of eternity is like this. So it's not saying it will not profit you, but in the scope of eternity, it really doesn't help you much. And you know what? So we need to realize the real us is not this. The real us is the spirit. Paul said this. Look at what? In 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely and may your what? Your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. What did Paul see? You know what? If you ask people what they are, you know what most people say? They're a body that has a soul and a spirit lives inside them. We're not a body first. What did Paul say we were first? We were a spirit who has a soul, the mind, and we live in a body. Do you understand? See, God's making a priority. Your spirit is the most important thing. Then comes your soul, your emotions, your mind. Then comes your body. In America, we want to make it all about the what? The body first. And yet the most important thing is not the body. The most important thing is your spirit. In our culture today, it's amazing. People get married many times because they like the other person's body. I got news for you. After 15 years and a couple kids, it's going to all sag. Hallelujah. It's all going to sag. I know people, they try to do liposuction and they try to do all this other stuff. I got news for you. It ain't going to work. Eventually, father time is going to win out. So if you base the whole relationship on a body first thing, what's going to happen when the body changes? You hear people say, I just don't love them anymore. But you know what? If you base it on your spirit, the real you, and what attracted you to that young man or that young woman is that they love Jesus. As you get older, everything else may be sagging a little bit, but you know what? You still have what you started with, the spirit relationship. So we need to make sure we keep the spirit first, okay? Verse 29. And suddenly they cried out saying, what have we to do with you, Jesus, you, son, uh, you the Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before our time? I find it interesting 
I find it interesting that demons acknowledge Jesus as the Son of God, yet people still deny that he even existed. The demons recognize that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. Have you ever talked to people and say, I just don't believe in that Jesus guy? He wasn't who he said he was. I got news for you. Then you're not, you're not any smarter than a demon. Because the demon said, you are the son of God. And so, you know what, folks? If you want to be dumber than a fifth grader, in this case, dumber than a demon, okay, just don't acknowledge Jesus, okay? Because even Satan's crew knows who Jesus is. And then at the very end of verse 29, it says, before our time. See, these demons knew their ultimate doom, which was, they were going to share with Satan and, and, and his cohorts, was dread. Look what it says in Revelation 20, verse 10. See, this is before their time. See, the demons and Satan has a time. This is in Revelation chapter 20, in the first nine verses, this is talking about uh, the, the millennium. And in the millennium, we're going to have a thousand uh, rule reign of peace with Jesus. And then the Satan is going to be let out for a short period of time. We don't know how many years, but a short period of time. And then Jesus is going to take him and cast him into the sea. Uh, it says here, that in verse, 20, uh, verse 10, chapter 20, Revelation. The devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. See, these demons knew what their ultimate demise was. That's why they came. To, the demons might know more about the Bible than some Christians because they saw, they know about Revelation 20. They know they're going to be cast in the lake of fire and brimstone someday and going to be tormented forever and ever. That's why they asked him, Is this, isn't this before our time? And then we found out in life too, folks, what? Every day people die and go to hell. Every day people will have to suffer in the lake of fire and brimstone. And it was not invented, it was not created for people. It was created for Satan and his cohorts. But people have chosen to go into that lake of fire and brimstone because they said, I don't want Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And you know how long it is? Forever and ever and ever. Jesus does his best work, though we found out, when we're desperate. And I don't know about you, but usually that doesn't get me too excited. I'm really not excited. I don't go to my wife and say, you know, honey, I'm so excited today. We're desperate. We're desperate? Oh, wonderful. I'm glad we're desperate. They see, that's when Jesus does his best work. When we're desperate. I don't know about you, but I don't like to get in that state many times in life. But you know what? We're finding out when we become desperate, that's when Jesus says, you know what? I got a miracle for you. In verse 30, now a good way off from there was a herd of swine, a many swine feeding. See, the law of Moses in, Le in Leviticus 11, 7, we don't need to turn there, but in the, uh, in the law of Moses in Leviticus 7, 11, 7 said that pigs were unclean animals. Now, I'm glad I'm not Jewish because my, my favorite piece of meat is a pork loin. That's my favorite piece of meat. But if I was a good Jewish boy, I couldn't eat that, okay, because they were classified as unclean. See, the Jews had a tradition. They believed that being a herdsman of pigs, of pigs or swine, were forbid, for, for, was forbidden because you they were unclean, okay? Why were there pigs there anyway then? Jesus had sailed to the east side of the Sea of Galilee. This area was known as the Decapolis, the city of ten. This was largely a Gentile area. So finding a herd of pigs would not have been very strange thing out of the ordinary on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. I find it interesting, though, on the east side of the Sea of Galilee, if you know anything, and someday maybe I'll teach on this, on the 12 tribes of Israel, when they went into the promised land, Manasseh and I think it was Reuben, they stayed on the east side of the Sea of Galilee, of the Jordan River. And you know what? So they should have colonized, and that, no, that's not a good word. They should have conquered that area and set up Jewish law there. But somehow, they didn't. So, it was mostly Gentiles now living on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. And so they had pigs there. That's why we find pigs there, okay? Because in the Jewish, in Israel, you would not find a pig farm. I'm just telling you that right now, okay? And verse 31. So the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, permit us to go away into that herd of swine. 
Jesus, get this, Jesus never spoke to the two men. He spoke to the controlling spirit that had brutalized their mind, their body, and their spirit. It says the demons begged Jesus. Why would they beg him? Because you only beg somebody who has greater power and authority than you do. It says in Matthew chapter 28, 18, and Jesus came and spoke to them saying, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. See, we don't have to be afraid of the evil of darkness. Do you understand what I'm saying? We don't have to be afraid of the demons and Satan. We don't have to be. No, I think we have to have a healthy respect. Okay, do you understand? But I don't have to be afraid of that. Why? Because Jesus has all authority over there. And in Matthew 28, he says, I'm giving you all the power and authority. Folks, I'm not looking behind every doorknob to find a demon. Okay, I'm, that's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying in my everyday walk in life, if I run across something like this, I don't have to be afraid. God's given us the authority to have dominion over them. Amen? We don't have to tuck our tail and run. Okay? It says in verse 32, and it says, And he said unto them, Go. So when they, when they had come out, they went into the herd of swine, and suddenly the whole herd of the swine ran violently down the steep place into the sea and perished in the water. You know what? Evidently, when these demons, in, in, in the other Gospels, it says that there was a legion in them. Evidently, these demons had been tormenting these poor people in their spirit, soul, and body, that when they got into the pig body, they just violently ran down and tried to kill themselves, or kill the pigs. Now, you know what, folks, I know this. You and I were made in the image of God. God doesn't want to share his temple with something like that, and we don't need to. Amen? See, people over the years have asked me a simple question, though. They said, why did Jesus allow 2,000 animals to die? You know who would have been after Jesus? PETA. They would have been after Jesus like nothing here, okay? We can only speculate this, but you know why I believe that? I believe that Jesus believed that two men's freedom was worth the price of a herd of swine. Come on. I can't tell. I think Jesus thought, you know what? I would rather have two of my creation set free, and if it cost me 2,000 pigs, so be it in life. Amen? See, I'm sure, okay, I'm sure that people were wondering about that, okay? We have a tendency as human beings to value everything with what? How much does it cost? Come on. Isn't that what, how we value things? How much does it, see, Jesus doesn't value things on how much money it costs. He values things on a human life. And I'm sure he thought, you know what? If it's going to cost 2,000 head of hogs, so be it in life. Now, we as human beings, we might, well, wait, wait. Are two people worth, let's see, the price of hogs are $100 a head. Two th I don't know if somebody's worth that. They are worth it. You know, I remember reading a story once many years ago. There was a, a, a country church. They are getting ready to have a revival. And they brought the minister in, and they had revival, and it was, kind of, it wasn't really well attended, but it was attended, and only one person came forward and gave their hearts to Jesus, and at the next council meeting, board meeting, they all gathered around the board members, the council members, and they were talking about the revival meetings, and some of the, some of the council member, board members said, you know, we spent X, Y, Z money, and you know what, I don't think that was a good investment, and they were talking about how terrible it was, they spent all this money, and only one person got saved. And there was one council member, he didn't say a word. Finally, after everybody had their say of, the, the, of what they thought and how they just thought that was a terrible use of God's money, the count, they said, hey, how about you, Fred? What do you think? Fred had tears down his eyes, and he said, you know what? I'll pay for that whole revival out of my pocket because that one person got saved was my grandson. See, so many times we want to judge everything by money. Jesus values life. Money, it's not that it's not important. It's just not as important as a life turned on to Jesus. Amen? Verse 33, it says that, then, they, uh, then those who kept the flock, and they went away into the city and told everything, including what had happened to the demon-possessed men. The herdsmen immediately fled the scene 
and went to town and told everybody that what had happened. And the people of town were now not a threat. Now the demon possessed people were no longer a threat to the townspeople. I'm sure, now this is a wild guess, I'm sure this was the number one story in their local newspaper that day. Twofold. Why? The herd of swine running over the cliff and drowning. That was big news. Come on, that didn't happen every day. But even bigger was that the two men that had been terrorizing the town were now no threat to anybody at all. Verse 33, 34. How I wish verse 34 read differently. And behold, the, t- the whole city came out to meet Jesus. Wouldn't it be great if there was a period and we stopped? Come on. And when they saw him, they what? They begged him to depart from the region. Don't you wish that story read a little different? Here, they just saw two demon-possessed men who had been possessed, had families that maybe hadn't seen for years, and now all of a sudden they're in their right mind, they're, 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 they're clothed, they're all these things. Wouldn't you think they'd been happy? Come on. And they told Jesus, too much, we don't want you. The townspeople went out to meet Jesus and no doubt saw the two former demon-possessed men in their right mind. The men who were once ran around naked, the men who used to shriek with demons, the ones who used to beat themselves with stones, were now seated and in their right mind, remember 2 Timothy 1, 7, God's not given us a spirit of love, a spirit of fear, but love and power and of a sound mind. Now these two men were having a sound mind, experiencing a new found peace and inner calm for everybody to see. And they looked at Jesus and said, get out of here. Get out of here. I want everybody to say, however. 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 The local people were filled with fear and begged Jesus to leave their district. May I say this speech reminds me of the demon speech earlier in the chapter. Let me get away from you, Jesus. Come on. Then the demon say, I want to get away from you, Jesus. Now we got people saying, I want to get away from you, Jesus. We should listen to what we're saying. Make sure we're not buddying up with the devil's crew and not Jesus' crew. Amen? Maybe they were afraid of the supernatural. Maybe they didn't want to risk any further economic loss. I don't know why, but I think it's sad that after they just experienced a miracle that they wanted Jesus to get out of town. I got a story, a personal story, just like this, saints, just like this. My mother, when they moved to Glenwood, Iowa, about 78 or 9 after Meryl and I got married, going to a traditional church, what we had always attended, that denomination, Mom was teaching at Glenwood School, and Mom had a massive stroke. Mom had, she stuttered terribly bad, walked with a cane, couldn't do a lot of things herself. Mom, that was in the fall, and Mom was going to, she had enough school days, sick days built in, she could wait till the end of the year to retire from school teaching. I remember Mom was she couldn't communicate hardly. And Meryl and I, we were at Oral Roberts University at the time. And we drove up to saw, see Mom. And I remember talking to Mom about what Jesus had done, done in my life. I remember Mom arguing with me, basically telling me he doesn't do those things anymore. I remember breaking down and telling Mom, saying, you know, Mom, I'm not here to argue with you. I'm here to tell you some good news that Jesus has put in my heart. That's all I'm here to tell you. I just want my grandkids, your grandkids, our children, to be able to talk with their grandma, to go out and have fun with their grandma. That's all I want. I'm not here to argue with you. And I remember Meryl and I, we left. And about maybe a week or two later, I don't remember the exact time, Mom was at home because she couldn't go to school anymore. She was watching the 700 Club. And you know what? Do I agree with everything that Pat Robertson does? No, but I don't agree with everything you do either. You're still my friend. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? Agreeing with 100%. Meryl and I don't even agree with everything, but we're still happily married at last I checked. Hallelujah. 
So you don't have to agree with everything to, to be friends. Do you understand what I'm saying? And I remember, so she called up the 700 Club, busy signal, first time. Dials again. A lady answers the phone. My mom's telling her her story, how she has a stroke, how she's uh, disabled, all these things. And the lady says, you know what? God healed me of this. So in Virginia Beach, Virginia, that morning, this lady prayed for my mother. My mother was healed instantly in Glenwood, Iowa. Instantly. From a prayer in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Now, people say, I don't believe it. You don't have to believe it. I saw it. This is not a story I'm telling you that somebody else told me about their parents. I'm talking about my mom. So my mom got healed, got to take away the cane, got to go back to school teaching. She goes back to church. She goes back to church. She sits down and everybody scatters. I'm just being honest with you. Everybody scatters. The church people were like the people from the town. See, they thought it was normal for my mom to have a stroke and be disabled. They could live with that. But the moment somebody touched the hem of Jesus' garment, they wanted nothing to do with it. How sad. That church was like the, church, like the town people. They told my mom, finally, and my mom and dad left. They said, basically, they said, we don't, have, we don't want anything to do with you. And I said, how sad is this? That the church, we think having getting sick is normal, but having a touch from God is not. How sad. These people had the door. Didn't Jesus say, I'm the door? These people had the door to heaven right there. And they said, we don't want to walk through it. But before we get too much on those town people, how many times have you and I experienced something? Come on. How many times have we gotten close and we said, no, this is too much, Jesus. You know, I want, to, I want to worship you from a distance. I don't want too much of this Jesus thing. I think we've all probably done that one way or another. See, in essence, you know what these guys are saying, town people? This is in essence what they said. You know what, Jesus? We prefer the pigs over you. Come on. They preferred the pigs over Jesus. Okay. They preferred sickness and evil and the devil to the one who had power over sickness. We already read about that in, in chapter 8, verses 2 through 16, who has the power over nature, verses 24 and 26, and the power over evil spirits in 38 to, uh, 28 to 32. We already see that. He said, we prefer the evil and the sickness over what you can do for us. How sad. But you know what, folks? We're living in a day. Folks, we're living in a day. There's an attack on the church of Jesus Christ. And when we're talking about an attack on the church of Jesus Christ, we're not talking about a building here. We're talking about you folks, me. You understand what I'm saying? The devil's attacking us. He's trying to say, you can't trust Jesus with sickness. You can't trust Jesus to help you with a disease. You can't trust Jesus to help you when you're in an evil spot. No, you can't. And then when something does happen to us, we're ashamed to tell somebody because we think we're, they'll think we're nuts. I shared with you many times, and I'll tell you this. You know what? When I was a young boy and I died and went to heaven and Jesus took me there, I didn't tell a soul for eight years. Because the church I grew up on, they would have thought I was nuts. They would have taken me to the hospital and put those, those uh, sleeves on me that wouldn't let me go. And then I met Marilyn's mom and dad who loved Jesus, who knew the power of the supernatural. And I told them, you know what? This is what happened to me when I was a little boy. And they said, I believe you. But you know how many people say, oh, that didn't really happen to you. But you know what? One of the few things I learned in seminary, cost me a lot of money for this, okay? But I learned this. A man with an experience is not at liberty to the man with the argument. I say that again. The person with the experience is not at liberty to the person with the argument. You can tell me all you want in life. There is no heaven. And you know what, folks? You can bark till you sound like a dog. But I've been there. I've been there. You think you are going to be able to persuade me that I wasn't there? You're not. I was there. Okay? I was there. <laughs> If you believe it or not, it really has nothing to do with me, okay? 
My mom got healed. You can say, I don't believe in that stuff anymore. I don't care what you believe. My mother went back and taught school for many more years because Jesus healed her. We can't be like the people of the town. Say, Jesus, would you just leave? We want to go back the way it used to be, living with the pigs. See, I want the worship team to come on up. See, it seems like the townspeople had learned to live under the fear of the demonized men, but didn't want to live in the freedom that Jesus bought for them from these oppressed men. I'm going to say that again. It seems like the townspeople had learned to live under fear of the demonized men, but didn't want to live in the freedom that Jesus bought from them, bought for them. See, sometimes we've been caught in something for so long, we can't think of ourselves any other way. And Jesus says, well, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. Rejected by the townspeople, Jesus honored their request and departed their area. Let me tell you this. Jesus is a gentleman. He will not force himself upon you or me. We have to make a choice. Do we want to live with the pigs or do we want to live with Jesus? He will not force himself upon you and me. If he would, he wouldn't even make us serve him all the time. Come on. It's a choice that you and I get to make. And what I hope today we learn in, in these lessons of miracles of Matthew 8 and 9, the last one in Matthew 8 is, you know what? I choose not to live with the pigs today. The world. I'm going to live with Jesus and for Jesus. Amen? Why don't we stand up?
Baker Jubilee has come. Come on, let's give the Lord this. Yeah. You know, as I get ready to pray the ironic blessing, you know, where you put your hands up once. Kingsbury, you did better the second time. Okay, thank you for that practice. Okay, out there. Yes, it will be. Okay, yes. Yes. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord make his countenance upon you and give you peace. And all God's people said, amen and amen. God bless you. Love Jesus. Take God's peace with you and have a great day. Amen. Thanks for coming.